Hey folks, I'm here with with fantastic, wonderful Ty Tabor from, of course, Jelly Jam, King's X, of course, Platypus, <laughs> and I'm a big fan, big longtime fan, I have awesome. to say. Yeah, That's I'll start, I'll fan out for a second. My sister is maybe an even bigger fan than me. She walked down the aisle to one of your songs, the King's X song, and okay. uh, so we're longtime fans for sure. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Ever since the '80s, but um. But Which yeah, I, oh, it was the difference. Oh, no kidding! Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's the first I've heard of that one. I think at a wedding. That's cool. So first off, uh, thanks to Alex from um, Orange for for hooking us up. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're they're a great company, and every now and then I make uh, uh, videos for them. I've got we got to give them a little shout out. Just, just the Orange guys, but I've got one of these Terror Stamp little amp pedals here that uh that i'm gonna make a video for a nice <laughs> folks at orange they're good people yeah so first off uh just overall you're of course known for king's x mainly but you've got many other projects you've been a part of which i've been uh just reviewing and kind of educating myself even more than i already knew on in the last few days you have eight solo albums out now oh uh, yeah as well yeah. as you know platypus jelly jam and uh Man, just so many different projects you've been a part of over the years. You're just a really prolific guy. I, I try to stay busy. Um, if I have the time, I try to make music uh, while I can because you never know when you can't anymore. And uh, it's just something I really love. And uh, it's sort of my therapy. Um, yeah. It's what I'm doing right now that we're all, all staying home. Um, yeah. I'll be leaving here as soon as we finish talking to go back out to the studio, to my studio. And uh, I've just been working alone out there every day, so I don't have any contact with people, so it's safe. Uh, yeah. But I'm making use of the time to keep recording. I've already uh, got most of the follow-up to Alien Beans finished. Wow, I just have, to, just have to do a bit of vocals, but musically it's finished. And uh, and I have a whole lot of songs to choose from to try to make it a you know as strong an album as I can. So that's what I'm doing with this time is to continuing to record. So I I really don't ever stop. If if we're not touring and I have time, I immediately start writing and recording again because you just never know what it's going to be. Uh, you know, a good time to put something out or whatever, or you never know when. The creativity is going to stop. Yeah. Because, you know, you have those dry spells. And right now things are popping. So I'm, I'm burning the candle heavily because I heard somebody uh, who's a writer talking about it the other day, calling it having the hot hand. And when you have the hot hand, you roll until it's gone, you know, because you <laughs> don't know when it'll come back. Well, that's how I feel musically. And uh, right now, this stuff is just coming out. So I'm hibernating in the studio and getting as much of these ideas down as I possibly can. And who knows if that'll end up being for King's X down the road or Jelly Jam or whatever. But that's where all the songs come from, just constant staying busy. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about that, um, about the process uh because you've got these different groups, and I guess with uh, Platypus and Jelly Jam, it's maybe got this sort of cinematic, darker kind of thing going on, and then King's X, of course. And and with your newest solo album, actually the Alien Bean solo album, which I've listened to nonstop over the last couple of days, and I just love it. Okay. Um, it's maybe a bit more, I think, uh, akin to a King's X record, if anything, I would say, just, just from my own listening. How do you decide when you're writing like well maybe this would be a song for jelly jam or this would be a song for one of my solo records or king's x do you do you have a process like what's the um i don't normally think of it that way at all um mm. i just write and try to have stuff that i like and whatever it is i like the most i will bring to whoever uh whether okay. it's jelly jam or king's x if i bring it to king's x it'll turn out to be one thing if i bring it to jelly jam it'll turn out to be an entirely different thing so um, the, everybody involved determines, uh, you know, how the songs change. I just kind of write what I write and bring it to each circumstance and throw it into the soup. And, and is that kind of funny? 
messes it up, you know, in their <laughs> own way, and and it creates a new thing, and that's the whole point of, it, it of must, a band. It mu- sure, sure. It must be fun having the different outlets too, and the different. Well, let's see what this idea. Let's plant the seed and see where it goes over here with this group, right? And yeah, then maybe, yeah, yeah. That's I I can't wait to play with each circumstance I'm in. I mean, I love playing with King's X, and King's X Live is the most enjoyable uh, live thing for me uh, mm. that I do or ever have done every time we play. It's it's so much fun. And I love playing with Jelly Jam too, but it's a lot harder. It's a lot more work, a lot more brain energy, and, and like taking a test to get through it. Um, so it it's a different thing, but I love the challenge of that too because it stretches me and pushes me in ways uh that i don't normally get pushed and i like that i like to put myself in an uncomfortable situation musically and try to get myself out of it and right. that's sort of how working with platypus and the jelly jam started out for me i felt like i was the oddball in the band who wasn't you know the prog muso that everybody else in the band had such mammoth history and power in in that area and i i'm more of a 70s blues based from the heart kind of guy uh, who doesn't read charts uh only time i ever (laughs) read charts in my life is doing music with platypus and jelly jam because i had to i mean we had some such ridiculous stuff that we'd have to write it out (laughs) um but i but even that that was just a great challenge for me because it's not the way i normally work so Right. I love all of the circumstances, all of the situations, playing with s- such different people who approach things so differently. Um, I always pull something different out of, of you. Well, and I think the thing that you bring to like Jelly Jam, for example, I mean, it is kind of interesting to listen to the way Rod and, and, and John like morph into kind of a more uh, like a less prog sound almost and a bit more of an atmospheric kind of or maybe more like blues bass rock kind of and melding those like the chemistry is really beautiful of that sound i appreciate that it is weird how it has come together because uh when we first started doing this and we were called platypus it was way more uh jazz fusion Mm. freakitude and out there um and over time it's just sort of uh well but even the early platypus had some 70s rock feeling stuff on it for sure Mm. i mean it definitely sounded like a 70s album to me um so it that was the biggest surprise of it all when i first started playing with those guys was that uh john in particular really has a 70s groove thing about him um the stuff he comes up with on bass a lot of stuff it's just perfect 70s music and it's not Mm. what i would expect him to come up with and on the other hand on the other hand, he'll do technical things that we also build a whole song around that are just insane. Yeah. Um, so, but but the big surprise was the '70s kind of the '70s rock foundation. That's where we all uh, that's where our uh, where we all came together. And, yeah. And I had to stretch from there, and they had to stretch toward that a little bit. You know. It's so cool, man. I wish there was more of people getting together these days and just making records and it is and it's kind of a 70s thing where you've got somebody from this group and somebody from that group and you know or maybe 70s and 80s but when i think about crosby stills nash and young and then or asia or like different bands where it'd be these coming together of um you know i just wish there was more of that going on where folks would just get together and make records (laughs) you know yeah I think there's a lot of it going on that we don't even hear about, probably just because it's a different record world now, and yeah. uh, you know, the way things are promoted are very targeted, and they're, you know, if you're not in the target, a lot of things get past you. Um, mm. But I, I also think there have been a lot of misfires. I won't name any, but you, you can put a bunch of names together, and it yes. just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's in. Thing, isn't it it's like you'd think oh this is going to be amazing then you hear it and you're like huh i didn't yeah you know. something something's missing yeah. yeah yeah it is it is a fascinating thing well <clears throat> i think it's one of the beauties though of having 
uh, you know, you've got Alien Beams Home Studio. You know, obviously, it's, you were mentioning it's right out back, right, of where you live. Well, it's actually not at home. It's uh, it's oh. about 10 miles away across the uh, state line in Kansas. I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Oh. And the studio is actually in Kansas, uh, just okay. right across the line, literally. So, and it, it, it's kind of changed locations uh, a couple times maybe over the years. Is that right? Yeah, I th- it's been in three different locations so far. Yeah. And have, is, have you? What's the setup like now? Have you got pretty much a full blown like you know separate control room and ISO and everything for? I do have that, and I don't even use it. Um, I huh. do everything out in the big recording room, and I've even okay. set up uh, my console and everything out there. I don't make, use a console, but what I mean is my desk and everything out there, um, and I use. Uh, partitions and barriers and headphones to do a lot of stuff by doing it in the same room. But lucky mm. for me, uh, most of my amps are transistor, or at least the ones I rely on the most. Yeah. And you can record transistors at low volume, and it's and if you record it wide open or on one, it's still identical for me. <laughs> I, I actually even get better tones at lower volumes with transistor amps when I'm not pushing the mic too hard. Uh, so it works out perfectly. I can put up barriers and stuff in just one big room and stay in the room. And something yeah. about the bigger space puts me in a better head space for working. I just, I started setting up originally in the control room area. I mean, it was all built that way for that reason. And yeah. I just hated it in there. So now it's storage. <laughs> <laughs> I just oh, yeah. used the, the recording room. Everything's in a great big room. That's really cool. I mean, when I think about uh, certain folks over the years, like Daniel Anwa had a big studio that was in an old movie theater or something, I think. And that's what he would do. I mean, everything was in the same room, you know, the console and the beautiful space and stuff. And, awesome. awesome. Uh, yeah. So that's, I just that's... do it for necessity. Um, mm. There's just, I have too many amps and stuff set up and keyboards. And I mean, the whole place is packed with stuff you know, all around the walls, all the way around me. Yeah. Um, but there's good open space in the middle for walking around to get to things and everything. And that's what I love. The, as long as I have that space, I don't feel like I'm serving time in there. It's I can be creative. Because when you feel cramped and closed <laughs> and no windows and stuff, it feels like being in confinement, you know, starts yeah. wearing on you. So the bigness of it is is the key for me for sure. But there is a whole lot of junk in there. I need the space. <laughs> so, like with the studio and recording and mixing, and uh, is is that something that uh, like an interest has grown over the years, of, or have you always been into that sort of thing since starting to sort of write songs and play guitar? I have literally been into recording since uh, you know those little cassette. Uh, yeah. like RCA recorders that came out in like in the 60s or whatever. Okay, um, yeah. They were like long and big, bulky and heavy. Right, and right. <laughs> these funky knobs. And I would set up two of those. Um, and what I would do is I would play guitar into one of them. And then I'd play that tape back and play with the tape and record to the next tape. So I learned <laughs> double tracking, triple tracking. I did that with harmonies and stuff as a young child and that's how I did it and I taped and came up with all kinds of stuff with harmonies and stuff and by the time you get to the end it's so warbly and you know and you know the audio has been degraded so horribly going back and forth <laughs> that it's you know horrible sounding but you can hear all the parts amazing uh, and so that's what got me into it by the time I was 14 and 15 uh, 14 actually yeah I was working at the local recording studio and Mm. my dad was, you know, driving me over on the weekends and I'd play a whole person's whole album in one day and get this huge check, you know, working, you know, 10, 12 hour days, uh, but just one day. And my dad would come pick me up and I was rich, you know, 14 year old with cash. (laughs) It was like... I cannot believe I get paid for this and how much I get paid for this. You know, per song was this huge amount of money. And we do 12, 14 songs. And I mean, I was the only kid that was 
that had anything like that happening that I knew of, you know, my age. Um, <laughs> and I, I, so I was heavily into uh, recording as early as I possibly could be and tried to learn everything I could at that studio. Um, played on all kinds of different albums of different types of music and learned a lot of things by doing that. Uh, it was like one of the first things that stretched me to do things differently was working in the studio. And so I think just growing up like that and having myself put in, I mean, I'd come into a room and it's like, I'm the guitar player for the day and here are the songs and we're going to get them done by nine tonight. And this is the style of music go. And I'd mm. be like, I've never done that before. I'll try to fake it and just do it. And, and it was that kind of stuff. And, Amazing. Somehow got through it all, and I did well uh, with it. And um, so that's how I got into studio work. It was just because I always loved the whole idea of building sounds on top of sounds and layering and just always been so completely fascinated by it that I had to go into recording. Um, wow. So I was doing that before I was in a band, uh, before I was you know serious out there playing or anything. What a I'm great education, so young. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and positive Maybe. affirmation of making some cash at that young age in the music oh, business. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, man. I really, I could not believe it. it I mean, it most was... people at that age, their parents are like, oh, no, don't play guitar. You need a fallback plan. Go to college. But by That's the time right. you're Dean, your folks are probably like, look at the cash she's making. <laughs> <laughs> My folks, like, bought me this really nice Martin guitar and bought me a really nice Les Paul. Um, they, they saw it. You know, they, they just saw it. They saw it early on. Um, well, that's kind of a funny story where they first saw it, too, because it could have been the end of my career, uh, my guitar life altogether in this one moment. But I used to, I, I remember being, I don't know, maybe three years old, maybe three, maybe four at the oldest. And I asked uh, my folks for a guitar for either my birthday or Christmas or, you know, one of those things. And because my dad had a guitar and he would play it every once in a while and I just was mesmerized by how it sounded. He would leave for work and I would, you know, wasn't supposed to, but I would go over and, you know, hit the strings and try to make sounds. And I started, I even taught myself my first chord that way on his guitar while he was at work. And when he came home from work, uh, I, I showed him, uh, here's the chord, you know? And so, uh, but that, that was a little later. What, what happened this first at first was I asked for a guitar and they gave me this, you know, one of those little plastic, you know, things that won't tune or anything, you know, from a store, you know, $5, you know, wall <laughs> art or whatever. Um, so, I remember taking it into our living room and my brother was in there playing with something. And I remember just playing it and going and getting really, really furious because this was no guitar. This was a toy <laughs> and it was insulting to me, this piece of junk. I can't make music with this. And I literally slammed it on the ground and jumped up and down on it and smashed it to pieces. My brother literally ran and stood in the corner to just stay a, as far away from me as possible <laughs> so he wouldn't be associated with it. He was scared. He thought I was going to get killed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I did it out of just, I, I remember at the moment I did it, I was just so mad that this thing was a piece of junk and not a real guitar. And, <laughs> That could have been it. You know, my, my folks could have seen that as just me being an ungrateful, spoiled little, you know, piece of <laughs> whatever. And that could have been it for guitar. But instead, they realized when I said what I said that I knew the difference and could tell, even though I was young. Uh. And they were like, OK, well, maybe we ought to maybe he's serious about this, you know. And so my dad then got me a cheaper guitar to practice on instead of instead of using his but um, <clears throat> um that that was uh the beginning of the guitar stuff was smashing it on the ground all because of tone because of sound so i guess that's <laughs> always been my, my thing you know well, that's great i mean the determination and the frustration of not being able to get anything out of this thing yeah. and 
see that you really wanted to do it. That's amazing. At that point, were you already kind of uh, fascinated by, say, the Beatles or something? Yes. Like, was, I was and, enthralled by the Beatles. Uh, they had, you know, they were a new thing, you know, hmm. putting out new singles all the time when I was a child. And I mean, they were a band still together until I was uh, nine and a half or so. Yeah. And, and even though I was very young, believe me, I was completely enthralled by the Beatles and every wow. single song when it came out. Uh, my next door neighbor who recently passed away, a guy named Mickey Poe, uh, really, really gifted guitarist and musician mm -hmm. who uh, was a big inspiration to me. Uh, he was my babysitter for a lot of years. And so he would always bring all of the latest Beatles singles, you know, over when he would babysit. Mm. And we were, I was the easiest person to babysit in the universe because all I wanted to do was listen to Beatle records. So wow. that's all I did the whole time until my parents came home. Do you have a memory of hearing things like, you know, Sgt. Pepper's or White Album or for, for the first time? I mean, you would have been seven or eight or something. I have earlier ones than that. My very wow. first remembrance of the Beatles is one of my earliest childhood memories. And it's from the song, I Want to Hold Your Hand. So I was, what, almost three wow, or so. And uh, that was my earliest uh, musical childhood memory. I have one other childhood memory earlier than that uh, that my parents confirmed was real and did happen. So uh, for some reason, I've got this one fragmented memory from when I was a child and had a bottle, a blue bottle still, uh -huh. And I knew where we were, the color of the car, what we drove by and everything. I described uh -huh. it to my folks years later. And they said, yeah, that was us going so-and-so so -and -so on the Natchez Trace. And you did have a blue bottle. And I <laughs> said, well, I, I remember that. I just have that image. And they were wow. like, that's incredible. I wow. even wrote a song about it uh, on the first Trip Magnet album, my uh -huh. first memory. And uh, But then my second early memory is I want to hold your hand. Uh, the Beatles. Wow, man. That's incredible. <laughs> it explains a lot. I mean, when it comes to, uh, you, you know, your writing, and I mean, I was going to say the early days of King's X, I mean, obviously, Out of Silent Planet and, uh, and, and Gretchen with like Goldilocks and Pleiades and these songs, that blending of the, the, the obviously, you were into the 70s rock thing and the heaviness, but the beauty and the you know the gorgeous kind of arpeggiated chord thing that you also became known for and whatnot obviously that must be referencing you know that early education of the beatles <laughs> from the it's, time three. it's a lot of things it's the beatles and it's uh in some cases it's even bluegrass music oh, okay uh, which i was raised on i played in a bluegrass band with my dad and my brother and uh, another family uh their dad and sons uh we all used to go camping together and, and do all kinds of stuff. We'd sit around the campfire making music and draw people up through the woods. It was amazing. I mean, we'd be in remote middle of nowhere, Mississippi. Huh. And uh, and I know this because I am one of the, you know, seven or eight people that bulldozed, macheted, and cut our way a couple of miles into the woods to make this camp. And it was our own place. No one was close. It was all private land. Yeah. We'd get out there, start playing bluegrass and around the campfire at night. And people would come from every direction who heard it through the woods and would just come and uh, be hunters, huh. you know, old guys with their dogs or whatever. But people just come toward the music. It's a trippy thing. That but is, I, was, wow. I was touring around playing bluegrass festivals and stuff with the, my dad and brother and my neighbor. Uh, Tim Pace, we were um, we were we were doing the Monticello Bluegrass Festival. Did it more than once. We were we did it, we played anything we could. So I was uh, I was out playing bluegrass. I wasn't out playing rock or anything. I didn't do any of that till I got a lot older. Wow! But okay. but I was uh, just exposed to that whole world too. And a lot of what I do comes from that. It's very. It, um, I remember I used to explain it to Doug and Jerry at because they get it now. But in the early days they they uh 
you know, I guess weren't didn't know too much about bluegrass. And I had to explain to them bluegrass, all that it is, is blues on steroids. Mm. It's blues uh, on speed in some cases, and in some cases not. You know, sometimes it's a slow dirge, mm. but it's blues. And that's where my blues licks came from was bluegrass. And right. that's where it came into the rock for me was uh, ah. from bluegrass. Fascinating, fascinating. Wow. Okay, that makes a lot of sense to me. So do you still really enjoy, for instance, say, playing acoustic guitar uh, as much as mainly known as being a heavy rock, rock electric player? And do you, But do you sit down with the acoustic and... And play bluegrass. The only, I, the only time I ever touch an acoustic is if I need to record an acoustic part. Okay. Um, and it's not from lack of loving to play the acoustic. It's from uh, the fact that acoustic hurts my hands, mm, hurts okay. my fingers to play too much. Um, okay. My hands aren't real strong as a, you know as a guitarist. My hands are pretty weak. I share and, that with you. Yeah. Same yeah. thing. Yeah. So what do you? I use, do you, you have I use, a. Any kind of issues with? I've got all kinds of issues. Yeah, yeah, I always have, and uh, both in both hands and wrists, huh. and racing motorcycles and uh, doing, you know, a lot of big jumps and having a, several bad crashes, and breaking uh, some bones. All of that stuff has come back to haunt me, and <laughs> you know, nowadays, and and everything hurts. Uh, but uh, but the hands really are, uh, they worry me. I, I did. I did so much trashing of them uh, when I was younger mm. that I feel now. Um, so I play very light gauge strings for one thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, nines on electric. Yeah. And um, and I use elevens on acoustic, which is also pretty light for acoustic. Um, Same as me. I mean, I'm, I'm on a 9.5 on electric. I went down from tens, uh, and I love them because they they still. Uh, pretty much sound to me like the tens, but um, if just a little bit less, you know, of that wear and tear on the wrists and stuff. I'm kind of built sort of slight, and I feel like I got a little occasional carpal tunnel and that kind of stuff going on and nerve stuff. So it's a. There are certain King's X songs we stopped playing live because mm -hmm. it caused me uh, some kind of something in the elbow. That mm. lasted over a year. Oh, really? And, uh, and wow. then the next time we tried playing the song, and we hadn't in a long time, the pain was almost immediate. And I said, no, guys, can't do that wow. one anymore. We're done. Isn't that interesting? Like certain moves will just, yeah. uh, you know, I actually find, I don't know if you find this, but warming up for me and getting into playing kind of abates. Like it gets better if I, uh, if I get the blood flowing and stuff. And actually sometimes playing helps is what I get. Sometimes I feel the issues more when I'm not playing. Yeah. I, I when I'm playing regularly, I have less problems for mm. sure. I think staying busy, you know, keep moving, keep using things helps, uh, keep it from, from being bad. Um, unless yeah. it's, unless it's a repetitive thing, like what was causing my elbow problem, then it's the Certain opposite. Rip. Yeah. yeah. But um, in general, after I've been playing for a while, my hands start feeling a lot better, too. Um, I, think, I think that's pretty normal, yeah. uh, especially the older I get, the more normal that has become. Do you have any kind of warm-up routine or things that you like to do, stretches or anything to kind of help with? I've never in my life warmed up, ever. Um, mm. When it comes to shows, I don't even see my guitar till I walk on stage. And uh, I mean, I played it at sound check hours before, but I don't sit back in the dressing room and warm up. Mm. And um, I do that on purpose because I play differently at first before I get warm than mm -hmm. I do after I get warm. And I like some of the ways that I play before I warm up when I'm slowing myself down and thinking more of note choice and style, you know, just to get in the in the groove. It, I find that I like what I play better then than I do later in the show when the hands are working. Because I, I, it's like I get lazier if the more they work easy or something. I, I don't know how to explain it. Ah, that's cool. I mean, the fact that you kind of appreciate the uh, the whole process of picking up the guitar cold and then warming up into it and 
and just sort of embracing the the fact that you you play a little bit differently when you first pick it up. That's great. I have always I get, done that my whole life. I've always done that. I get a little freaked out if I'm not warmed up, so I'm always. But maybe I should think about it like you more. <laughs> I, I, was, I like I like doing anything that we call uh, walking the plank. And hmm. we there are several things in King's X we call walking the plank. One of them is when you go off into a jam and they hand it to you and you have stepped all the way out and <laughs> now you got to figure out how to bring this back or what to do with it. And, and it scares us all and it's what we live for. I mean, we do nice. it every night. Um, King's X is very much into walking the plank. It makes yeah. new things happen. It also makes mistakes happen every once in a while, but taking those chances is where you get to the good. And, <laughs> it's like Warren Haynes says, mistakes are opportunities. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So we, anytime the plank is displayed and one of us sees it, we almost run toward it. <laughs> it's like, okay, let's get ourselves out there uncomfortable and see what happens. The good stuff. That's cool. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so this is kind of an intangible, I know, uh, and it's probably hard to, to, to put your finger on exactly, but, um, that beautiful way that you have of combining, um, uh, it's like, uh, you know, even in a riff, a heavy riff, like dog man, the interesting or, uh, the, 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 the sort of the chords and the dyads and stuff that you're playing on the top strings in the main riff, while you're also keeping the heavy going underneath, it's this fascinating part of your style that, to me, it's a, uh, when when let's say when Dogman came out. I mean, it's the mid '90s, and a lot of people would drop D, which you guys really, I mean, were pioneers of, and uh, and playing these heavy riffs, moving one finger down on the low three strings, kind of thing. But that was never what you were about. It was like more of this combination. There was a lot more sophistication going on while you were keeping the heavy going with this. Kind of, and where does that come from? I mean, that style of writing that you, you know. Uh, to be honest, I think that it most likely is mostly influenced by Alex Lifeson. Oh, wow. Um, Great. Yeah. Because there are a whole lot of riffs. It's especially on the early stuff up through Hemispheres or so. Excuse me. Um, where he would um, play a repeating uh, kind of riff or line. Uh, where the bass note of it might change the chord, but but the other part would stay the same. And in doing that, a lot of times he would have an open drone note, or or he'd be holding a note that you know solid while he did something else. And those little things I picked up on big time. Something about that just I was it it sucked me in like a magnet. Um, there are Interesting, like Tom Sawyer or something, right? Where the, where there's the riff moving underneath and doing that whole yeah, that type of yeah. stuff. Or um, like circumstances has a really interesting guitar part in the middle of it, where it, the the part kind of plays forward and then backwards, sort of, um, oh. if I remember correctly. This one little part, and I just remember being completely intrigued by that. Um, I was just a huge Rush fan all the way through moving pictures and, you know, and some beyond, but was just serious fan through all the early stuff. And awesome. Lifeson did some very innovative riffage with other notes going on. And I, I have to say that's most likely where it comes from. Although the Beatles did it too. I think mm -hmm. anything that we like, the Beatles did first. Pretty much, <laughs> it's as yeah. far as the stuff I play, um, including tuning down. I mean, I want you to see so heavy. That yeah. was my eye-opening moment. Of, you can't play this unless you cheat. You have to tune this string down, and that was <laughs> like, ah, oh, you. I guess you're allowed to do that, you know. And the wow. Beatles were the first to do that, you know. That that I I heard, and uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah, Beatles and Alex Lifeson, I'll give credit for that. <laughs> That's awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah, Alex, he's he's fascinating. I was I do a live stream every Sunday, and I was talking about him this past Sunday and how Rush was so interesting because you had Neil and his unique thing, 
and then Getty was this sort of really complete, you know, musician, obviously doing the keys and the Taurus pedals and obviously the bass and vocals all at the same time. And then yeah. Alex had this amazing, the arpeggiated thing that he, that he did. And then also the kind of Jimmy Page leads, which was like needed in Rush. Yeah. You know, <laughs> had, had he been not, there, there was a sort of almost like, I don't want to say a sloppy, but a a little bit of an off the rails thing to the leads compared to what Neil's doing with precision. That chemistry was so magic. That's a guys. perfect way to put it. That's a perfect way to put it. It always felt to me like it was on the verge of off the rails. Right. It, right, right. A lot of times, but the perfect notes, the perfect angst, the perfect part, you know? Yeah. Just what was needed with all that exactly. precision going on and the drums and everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love them too. Big, big, big fan. So moving moving on to the the kind of the Atlantic era that you guys uh, you know you're working with Sam Taylor for a long time right on the the the, the early albums and then you got into working with somebody like Brendan uh, on Dogman uh, fascinating change in sound and timbre and everything and also I mean even you with your gear moved away from what you'd been traditionally. Uh, using what was that transition like like w working with a different producer different equipment almost a heavier sound I mean uh... um, well truthfully it was kind of just natural yeah. at the time for us because uh, the way I felt was by the time we got to the fourth album we were um, trying to imitate ourselves in what we thought King's X was supposed to be and oh. the fact is when we recorded the first album there were no rules mm. of what we're supposed to be and I found myself by the fourth album going what are we why what are we doing you know uh, let's don't stay in the past let's move forward and I Walk remember the plank, maybe. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest with you the only reason I changed guitar tones at that time was I was sick and tired of all of the old horrible gear I was touring with that broke uh -huh. down all the time constantly it ruined so many shows yeah. and the Strat Elite even though it's the best sounding Strat I've ever played in my life and I still have it I'm still using it in the studio um, through the lab matter of fact and it sounds good but that thing is the most microphonic guitar that <laughs> I've ever known uh, wow. to the point that we literally use it in the studio with King's X to sing into the guitar <laughs> pickups. And we've done, we did it on this latest album. We did it like on Gretchen and on other albums, you know, certain words would come through and it, they'll be sang into my guitar because it's so microphonic, Amazing. which is, which is a curse when you're out touring. Because right. Tons of feedback there were times, the yeah, the RF signal would be as loud as a wide open power cord. So it was unusable uh, in, you know, 20% of the venues we were playing, which is enough venues to really ruin a tour for you when you never know when you're going to get to use what you want to use. Yeah. So after years and years of that kind of touring, um, that's the only reason I changed my guitar rig. I just said, I am so sick and tired of this junk we're playing through um, to get these tones that I've got to try something else. Uh, so th at that point, I started using some boogies and I tried Zion guitars. Right. And, you know, I started trying to find some other pickups that could sound like those elite pickups. Yeah. But the truth is there aren't any. I mean, we never came even anywhere even close with huh. any of the guitars that we yeah, tried you had to. Yeah, Arden's for a while and the Zion guitar, yeah. right? Different, but it just wasn't quite the same, eh? What, just, what do you think yeah. it is about that, those pickups? I mean, besides the mic microphonic aspect, there's the there's a preamp, right, with a treble and a mid-boost or something? Yeah, so. I think the mid-boost is the key. Um, hmm. If you set the mid-boost just right and crank it, um, that guitar gets nasty. And that's how yeah. I've had it set my whole excuse me, the whole King's X career has been set that way on the preamp. Um, and so even on the cleaner key. parts, eh? Like... Well, what happens is that particular guitar, it's, it's, it's almost hard to use it on clean parts because 
when you roll back off of top only one or two numbers, mm. you go from what feels like about gain on 10 to gain on four. Mm. I mean, it's that much of a significant drop off just with a slight roll off. And it continues to clean all the way down till it's so bright and clanky, it's unusable. So okay. you, you have to be with, with my elite, I have to be super careful how far I can roll down and exactly what sweet spots I keep the volume in while doing rhythms. It does best not wide open, but slightly rolled down is where it mm. sounds best. That's so that's fascinating. I've never really thought about that more. You're more of a roll down for clean player. Maybe then total roll down for clean. I don't use clean channels. Okay, cool. Good I use guitars that can get me clean. That's where okay. I want to find it is in the guitar. Maybe it's part of that guitarist thing, though, that 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 aggressive roll down and being able to get a chimey clean and then tons of distortion all the way up. Eh? I, I certainly depended on it for years, and it's a it's all over the first four King's X albums for sure. It sounds like, too, like maybe is it correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of uh, bridge and middle pickup together for m many of the sounds. Is that right? <clears throat> Actually. It's far less of that than you would think. A okay. lot of the times when it sounds that way, it's bridge pickup, and I don't know why it has that kind of oomphy, you know, two pickup sound, but it, it does when you go wide open. Huh. And uh, when you roll down a little bit, it goes off of that into sounding like a bridge pickup. Uh, go wide open, it almost opens it up to feeling like it's a humbucker or mm. something. So it almost gives it a fullness like you kicked in the other pickup. But the truth is, I, I don't ever use that, the first and second pickup, uh, pick except for on Summerland. Okay. And, um, and the big picture, I think I may have used it on that one. But yeah, in general, I don't use that much. Now, there, was, wow. there, were, there were times when I would use the bridge and the neck and skip the middle and that might you might be hearing that on some things interesting that or that. almost like a telly sound for right it's like it's just that particular yeah. guitar it's a it's a sweet tone yeah i've do tried it have, on other guitars that didn't sound good at all do you have more than one of them or is it that main red one i had i had more than one i sold all of them except for that one and uh huh. that's the only one i have now it's it's retired <laughs> made for the, the studio only i guess studio I guess. only yeah my house in the studio that's it when i saw you recently you you were playing a uh it looked like a strat with maybe humbucker in the bridge and two singles live is that right or was it uh, three it would have been all singles if i had a strat i don't i don't own any sing. strats with uh any humbuckers in them forgive me i'm having a senior moment that was my memory from the game but it was must have been the three singles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh well, while we're talking about it, I, I might as well pick your brain. I'm, I'm almost scared to ask you this stuff because I saw your uh, your part five uh, studio uh, uh, update from Pasadena and where you, you mentioned, yeah, I've got oh. nothing but time when people ask me about my gear. I just love it. <laughs> I have nothing but time for that. <laughs> yeah. But, but it never ends, right? I mean, it's like as guitar players, it's, we talk about this stuff, and it's like, so I got, I got to ask you. I mean, you, you recently uh, in the, the Pasadena sessions for the King's X record, I saw in the video using the Lab Series amp again and stuff, and it's that, yeah. So a little bit of a full circle. Would you use it live again? I mean, after all the problems and everything that you mentioned a few minutes ago. I would. Ago. I yeah. would if our if our if our touring situation elevates to the next level um, where there is more crew and more help involved uh, then yeah I, I could see using labs live yeah. now the way we do things right now it doesn't make sense and mm -hmm. uh, the fact is I'm getting such a killer killer tone out of my transistor orange amps yeah uh, that it's very lab-ish, you know, in its own way. That's great. Uh, so, so I'm able to use it with King's X, and and, uh, and it works perfectly for it. And and it's, of course, way more dependable yeah. and less noisy and easier to get one replaced. So, so which, what's the model you use? It does sound amazing. When I saw you at the whiskey, you are using it, and it sounded terrific. 
I'm using the CR120 Pro, and it's okay. their only head that is transistor. And mm. I'll tell you a story about it. Um, I, you know, I'm, I've been a big fan of Orange Amps since high school. And in the 70s, I had an orange stack that I bought uh, from a from a pawn shop that somebody had pawned off and couldn't couldn't pay it off. So I bought bought it and um, used to play it live. And it didn't have a master volume. You had to you had to crank it wide open. But it was a 50 watt head mm. and wide open. Man, it sounded just sweet. And I loved that amp. So I remember you know years back. Orange was getting really, really popular again, you know, becoming like the biggest amp in the world uh, five, six years ago when everything and everybody was, you saw, had Orange amps on stage. It yeah. was crazy. Um, I remember somewhere around there, I I think Alex came to a show uh, with a, a friend, uh, I think, I hope I pronounce his night, name right, Chris Michener, also okay. at Orange. Mm -hmm. uh, who uh, brought Alex out to a King's X show and introduced him to me at the end of the show. And he just said something like, hey, we ought to, you know, uh, look at working together or something. I said, yeah, absolutely. And so I kept in contact after that. And uh, Alex was so cool. He sent me pretty much everything they had that was their really top of the line killer amps. He even mm -hmm. sent... Uh, one that was that came from England, that there were only two of them like it made mm. at, at that moment, and they were, I guess, trying to decide if it was something they were wanting to do. Sent that to me, and all of it sounded great, but there was something about the attack to the aftertone that I couldn't quite get what I was wanting to get. And so Alex said, "Well, man, uh, we've only got." got one more amp we can send you and um, it's the bar that's our bottom of the line it's, it's a transistor i said it's transistor i didn't even know you <laughs> made transistor amp please send me that <laughs> and so so he did and i mean the second i plugged in i i told him instantly this is more what i'm looking for this has the attack i'm looking for you wow. can't get it with tubes or i can't just yeah. can't do it how interesting i mean you you, you really uh like kind of carry the the flag you know between the the lab i mean and of course there's departure over the years and i love that you've been able to get incredible tones out of whatever you use be it the dual rectifiers i think you used a 30th anniversary marshall uh for a minute right on the ear candy album I mean, the opening chord of the first song on that it's actually the 25th is, anniversary and then i had a 30th backup yeah Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That, but that song, the train with that, uh, that is a benchmark kind of, I'll put that on sometimes when I'm going, is my tone up to snuff right now? And I'll listen to that because <laughs> that first chord sounds incredible, but, okay. um, uh, you know, whether it was Marshall or the dual rectifiers, the lab series, and, and now you're back to uh, Agnator, I think you used for right. a little while, the preamps. Agnator stuff and, and Randall stuff, both I used, uh, which the Randall stuff I used was designed by Agnator. And then I mm. just went straight to Agnator stuff after that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I used that preamp for a while as well on tour for the uh, the M4, you know, with the, I had an RT250 and all that stuff as well. So I, I like that gear as well very much. Too, but now the fact that you come full circle back to the solid state again and you get excited about it, right? <laughs> Send me that. I, I love that. that it, yeah. There's not a, you don't seem to have a, a uh, the, like that stigma that some people have. Oh, I'll only use this or only because you played the Axe Effects for a while too, right? Sure which, did. So yeah. you'll try anything if it sounds good, right? Which I love. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't care what it is if uh, I don't care what it costs either. I've learned over the years uh, that some of the best gear that I own still to this moment uh, is some of the cheapest stuff I've ever bought. Mm. Um, there are some pieces of gear that just have something magic to them, whether it be all of the old components that luckily came together to make this beautiful tone, yeah. things that can't be replicated anymore that can be found in cheap gear. And mm -hmm. so I depend on a lot of low dollars. I put it like, like I'm saying earlier, we, I don't, have this uh, thing where I won't look at something because it it's cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think if you do that, you rob yourself of some great uh, finds. Sure. When it comes to tones and sounds. Matter of fact, that blue. I don't know if you can see it. There's a blue guitar up way in the back. I think so. Let's see it. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, that thing. I bought for 120 bucks. <laughs> it's my best, you know, 335 type guitar that I've ever owned. Oh wow! And, wow. Uh, I've actually gotten rid of my other ex more expensive ones. And that's the one I play. It sounds and plays better. And wow. yeah, every once in a while, I people see me with something like that and they make fun of me. You know, like, I can't believe you're playing. Out. You know, and yeah, but then they should consider who they're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> the, only, the only thing I can think is uh, I'm glad that you will pass this up and miss this and let me take it. <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen to the tone coming out before you. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, but so with something like the the L five, I I've often wondered they're not obviously made anymore. They were made for sh you know relatively short period of time. It was really you and BB King, I think, that were the guys that you know the main users of that amp. That that's right. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, but I, I often wonder like would a company like Orange maybe they could make a new one, you know, just look at the circuit and do something with it and come up with a new, has that ever come up like a signature uh, thing or. Uh... Um, there's somebody who claims to have done that in a pedal form, but I've never been able to try one to hear it, to know if, if it works or not, or if it's huh. accurate. Uh, but there is somebody who put it out in a pedal form. Uh, wow. I'd love to try one, but, uh, yeah. I've got real ones, so I'm not going to pay for one. So I, have never tried one. Have you got quite a few of them? I've got a few to yeah you know, for backup just in case. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Well, it's a, it's such a sound. I've personally never gotten to try one. I got to try one one of these days. I need to track one down, and check it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love them, but I'll be honest with you. Everybody I know that's ever played through one. Yeah. Just thought it was one of the most horrible sounding things they've ever <laughs> plugged through. And and the reason is. There's only one or two spots in the settings to me that are worth using on the amp. There are huh. two two type of tones that can be used on the amp that are spectacular. Wow, and if wow. you have the knobs anywhere else than those two settings, it's one of the most wretched sounding, horrible things I've ever heard. And <laughs> so somebody being able to stumble on just the right frequency and, and push and all that to dial it in. Yeah. It would be extremely difficult, and most people I know have given up and just think it's a horrible amp. Interesting. But, but people like Alan Holdsworth, B.B. Uh, King, uh, even Eric uh, Johnson um, knew how to find the sweet spot and huh. get that saxophone out of it or something. You know, it's it's uh, huh. it's just got this thing that no other amp will do. But yeah. finding it, you know, it's like good luck. <laughs> it's got to be the right guitar, too. It's got to be the right guitar or it just doesn't work in that amp. Well, and with your guitar being so unique, I mean, it's just that magic chemistry that I can't imagine, you know, how uh, how different, say, a normal, you know, guitar would be when that, than something with those active pickups that are microphonic with a preamp in it. It's such a unique thing. Um, but I play Les Pauls through it, too. I mean, I'll, play, uh, yeah. I'll play straight humbuckers through it, too. And that's it's, cool too. It's way over the top, but yeah, it works. Um, did you use the internal speakers on them a lot? Because the most of them are combos, right? Uh, I think. Um, or did you use external cap speakers? Such an overall huge part of the sound, right? Um, back in my day of using labs with King's X Live, I always disconnected the speakers. You did, okay. And used it just as a head, and I would push. I would go into some kind of big power amp of some kind and then push some big 412s, you know, sometimes up to eight 412s in the old days. So mm -hmm. um, I had basically just, I even started having them chopped at the body, having them chopped mm. just to save room on the road because I wasn't using the speakers. And then just put the bottom up there and make it a head. And okay. I did that. I've got a few of those like that where it's just a head. That's a chopped L5 with the speakers taken out. Uh, looks like an L11 or whatever. Interesting, interesting. Now, uh, 
and I just stop me if uh, if if you want to because I don't want to dig into too many of your secrets because this is not cool. But anything <laughs> you're okay. willing, anything you're willing to tell me, uh, I don't think which, I have any secrets anymore. They're all out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that uh, some people talk about a Ross flanger and also the MIDI verb uh, were two effects that that you used to use. Now I was always fascinated by your solo tone, which sounded like it might have a bit of a short delay or something on it. Or was there anything going on there that that you can? There were two two ways I did that sound for the lead. One was to use a, like a 21 millisecond delay or maybe mm. even less, 18. Really? And yeah. with a modulated delay. Okay. And modulate the heck out of it. So that really? That, so that that fattens whatever the tone all of a sudden is. But probably almost just, no feedback, right? Yeah. Just like a quick... It's just wow. a quick, wider sound. And if you shake a string... It makes the sound way more dramatic than without it. I mm. mean, it's, it feels like the speakers are coming out of the cabinet, and all it is is that slight delay uh, fighting with, because it's modulated. And another way I used to use uh, do that was with an MXR pitch transposer. It's this double rack space, big blue thing that I bought in a pawn shop again you know for a hundred bucks or something somebody didn't even know what it was and right. i'd say i'll take it and uh i used to take that thing and it had a, a digital readout on it and the very first click down to the first s splitting of pitch was that would go from 100 to 99 okay that for me was too much of a split to use for guitar and leads. It might work cool on vocals. Okay. So what I used to do is I used to get that knob and it took such fine nudging and hoping that the stage didn't get <laughs> vibrated during during the playing to get it between 99 and 100 where it's flickering. And that was the perfect lead sound. That was all over King's X stuff. It, wow, it, wow. it, it did that splitting like a random thing and it's the magic of it man and wow i've wow. never seen anybody use that ever on anything before i've never wow. even seen another one of them before i think you might have given away the keys to the kingdom <laughs> <laughs> now that thing which is probably sitting in stores everywhere for twenty dollars is gonna disappear <laughs> Well, I mean, it was a really, really wonderful lead sound. I mean, the fatness to it. And like you say, shaking note on your vibrato. So, okay, you, you know, I got my homework. I got to go try it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I always loved that. Was and, and the MIDI verb was in your rack for a while, too, which was an Elisa. MIDI, MIDI verb was very key, actually, to all of the early King's X tone. Uh, yep. Everything I ran through went through the, I mean, all of that sound went through a MIDI verb unit before it hit the power section okay. and what i would use the midi verb for is there was some setting somewhere in the upper 50s or lower 60s of the presets on the mm -hmm. original midi verb one mm -hmm. and um that thing i had some kind of chorus effect or a flange that you could just barely dial in and it was real slow that is all over king's x stuff in, mm. on the first four albums but another way that we did that a lot of times if we didn't do it with effects at all what we did was i would play the part and then we i would repeat it again immediately and they would vso the tape machine down a couple of cents ah. i'd play the whole thing again then do it again a couple of cents play it whole thing again put those three guitars together with those slight variances uh but perfectly in tune slight variances sure uh yeah. it has a unique flangey chorusy effect uh without being a chorus it's it's a different thing but it has that kind of a feel to it how oh, fascinating yeah a true like analog created detune that exactly. wasn't an even tied or something right yeah because yeah. you know every time you hit a string it's gonna you're going to hit it slightly different. It's going to wobble or vibrate different, and it's competing against two other strings at the same time being hit yeah. at a different time uh, with a different wobble. So it just makes this big note. You know, every note's big. Amazing. 
Well, um, I was I was going to mention the song. Uh, let's see, the track "Lies in the Sand," um, which is off of Ear Candy, right? Uh, and the leads. This is getting a little bit away from gear and a little bit more into just your approach when you play leads. Um, tons of space, and I always loved. I, I did a video recently, actually, called "Digestible Phrases," and I, I I called it that because, and I used Angus Young as an example, um, saying how he plays in these digestible phrases. And that solo on "Lies in the Sand" really does that, where you're going to play something and then rest for a second, and then play again and rest for a second. I love how you do that. Um, is, is that just a part of what you do, or do you think about that consciously? Or I, I'll be honest, when it comes to playing, I don't think um yeah. I, I don't ever analyze uh i don't usually use that side of the brain when i'm playing i mm. the, the analytical part like i should approach this this way i mean sometimes i might decide that, i'll tell you as, the, as far as i will go with that is maybe the first note okay I'll, sometimes i'll tell myself i'm gonna start on this note because i don't know how to get myself out of that and so that's all I'll plan. Okay. I don't analyze the solo. I analyze, okay, I'm going to be coming into it from here, and how am I going to get there? I'll do that every once in a while just to make me do something different because you just play the same. It's easy to get lazy and play the same stuff that you rely on to get the job done. Mm. And I enjoy hearing myself when it's uh, almost about to go wrong. And there's a little yeah. danger involved. Walk so, the plank again, right? <laughs> exactly. So I don't, uh, I don't analyze uh, or think like that. I'm going to leave space in this solo. It's all about what do I feel. Uh, so you've really tapped into that. That's fantastic. And I don't usually know what that's going to be before it happens. Uh, mm. It just, ha I just do it. And okay. the more I play a solo, the worse it gets. It's uh, only good the first or second time when it's being done that way. Okay, off the off the latest solo album, uh, Freight Train. That's a killer tune, by the way. I love it. The, the first note, I know it's you. I just know it's you. If I had known it was your, so you bend, and it might be up to the root. First note of the solo, and there's a thing that I really kind of analyzed and listened to it over the last couple of days. But you've got this thing where you'll bend, hold the note, and then you lay into the shake of the vibrato yeah. right before you move on to the next phrase. I don't know what it is, man, but it's, and I go, that's Thai, you know, when I hear it, and it's so beautiful. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah. I, I don't think about that at all. That has got to be copying somebody that I love. There are a lot of players that do that, and I love it when I hear somebody do that. And they, I mean, I don't think about it, but obviously I'm copying them, apparently. <laughs> they, but well, you know, like a Trower, I think it's good at that, too, where you can hit a note and then that shake and it's just like oh man yeah I, there's something really unique about it like where a lot of guitar players might just the vibrato instantly but there's something about when you you hit the pitch and then you accentuate and it's just <laughs> it's your it's it's like a singer singing and you know it's them you know their voice it's incredible but i, I you know, that's probably a lot of brian may in that too uh, he's the master of that of hitting sure. the note and then the shake and his touch uh it's he's he's probably my favorite uh touch player on the earth and always has been mm. my neighbor I, I told you about uh named mickey pogue he was very much a touch player that's mm -hmm. what i loved about his playing thank god i grew up next door to him and learned that you mm. know early on that that was the most important thing because he would hit one note and that do that thing, and I would just realize that's way better than the licks everybody else are playing. It's just that's what's important, you know. And yeah, lucky for me that dude was my neighbor, and such an inspiration to me, and, and cared to show me and teach me, and you know, and put up with me as a, as a younger kid. Yeah. But, um, but uh, Brian May is he's very much like a Brian May player or and like Brian May and Jeff Beck put together uh, uh, you know strange wow. notes with incredible style uh huh yeah i mean <clears throat> so much uh vocal quality in Jeff's playing and in Brian's playing and in your playing so that makes a lot of sense 
but that's that's really it's important because I, I mean I see a lot of um, great players these days. I mean, it's incredible the explosion of new guitar players that are out there and young kids that are just killing it and stuff. But it's important to just say, I think, don't play so much all the time <laughs> to, to some of these kids because it's like, like I compare it to would you want to listen to a singer going blah, 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 singing a million notes? It's like just can hold a note for a second and let me digest that for a minute. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I like that. I just I come from the seventies. All of the seventies players were like that. It because lead yeah. solos were supposed to be like a vocal vocal solo. They're they're supposed to be things you hum or sing uh-huh. with or or know the melody of the lead solo. You know what I mean? It was all about the melody. Yeah, and yeah. The solo takes you on a, on a ride, right? Yeah, it's yeah. just treated just like a voice, you know. And that's yeah. why I think that's a perfect example to say it that way. You know, yeah. nobody sings that way, so give give people a break every once in a while. <laughs> Absolutely. Then they'll appreciate it more, you know. Absolutely. And then when you do take a fast lick, I mean, when I think about the song Freight Train, then you do do this kind of towards the end of the solos. There's this technical, you know, and then it's really got impact because it's not the whole solo where you're just. <laughs> cool. cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, That's I, I, Phil Keggy is a, a solo soloist who every, I've seen him do that a lot where he could take his time getting there and when he gets there it's then it's just oh my gosh what did he just do you know yeah and, yeah and it has yeah. that impact because you got yeah. taken there you know and instead of just walking into a room getting slapped <laughs> yeah man I saw God I saw Fleetwood Mac um a little while back right before Lindsay actually wasn't playing with them anymore and i'd never seen them and i had this whole new appreciation for him because i always knew he was amazing but uh he took a solo that maybe went on for two or three minutes and started down low and built an idea a lot of repetition where he was really nailing in a melody and and then he built up the neck and built up the neck and built up the neck you know and dynamically it went somewhere and ended up doing something that was just i just remember going oh my god and they stopped on the last note of the tune and this like you know housewife behind me that's not a guitar player went holy shit you know And it was at Dodger Stadium, too. Uh, it was a journey in Fleetwood Mac show at Dodger Stadium, you know. And so I was in a crowd like, and I was way in the back. And that was the effect he had on that lady behind me. And I thought, you win. Like, that is, <laughs> you know, that's a hell of a thing if you can move somebody with a guitar solo like that. No kidding. But, and he is one of my all-time favorites, too. He's who I so list he, in my top ten. Of He's influenced me more than than most, for sure. Uh, mm. And all from the very first album I was aware of with him was called Buckingham Nicks. Right, yeah. Uh, that's the album that completely blew my mind. And it's my, you know, if, if if you have five albums only, you know, for your, you know, deserted island musical listening, that's one of my five is that first album he did with, with, uh, with uh, Stevie Nicks. And yeah. that Buckingham Nicks album... I, I still play it all the time to this day, but the guitar work on that record is absolutely perfect. The solos, mm. the the acoustic playing, all the different layers and sections, just amazing. So from that, uh, I became a big uh, fan of Fleetwood Mac, uh, mainly because of him. Uh, I was aware of Fleetwood Mac, but I wasn't really listening much to him until he, you know, he and Stevie joined, and uh, and I was totally uh, a fan of his throughout the, all the '70s and all of that. Just freaked on him every time I had a chance to see him play. The way he would play that White Les Paul in mm-hmm. the old days, you know, just with thumping it with his index finger, and it got such a nasty, just ugly energy to it that nobody else could do I, 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 you can't replicate the way he plays you know completely unique yeah yeah so cool so cool <laughs> well i don't want to keep you too long this has been amazing but um I, I just wanted to ask you with the the album you guys recorded in pasadena uh the king's x record and then what you're working on right now what's next what comes out next for you we ha- we all you know all of us had 
a year of touring planned out. And uh, mm. so we, we'll just have to play it by ear and see how that works out. Uh, I'm just going to make use of the time, like I said earlier, and yeah. uh, go ahead and make the follow-up to Alien Beans. Uh, that wasn't the plan for this time of year, but you just roll with it and make the best of it. And uh, we're just going to be safe. And uh, yeah. I hope we all get through this, you know, sooner than later, I hope. Yeah, I hope so, man. It's been a, such a weird time. But the interesting thing, I don't know if you feel this, but for musicians, it's maybe not been as different because we're used to one thing, random employment, and another oh, thing yeah. is holding up alone. <laughs> a lot. That's right. In studios, right? I know. So. I, I, the only thing different for me that has changed is I don't go to the grocery store now. And ah. That's the only thing that's changed in my life, basically. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I go to the studio, I'm alone there, and I'm here at home with my lady and my dogs, and she's working from home, we're staying safe, and yeah. luckily she's still able to work, and uh, and I you know, have a studio where I can go make music, so uh, we're trying to just be positive and do the best we can and keep moving. That's awesome. Well, when we come out the other end of this thing, everybody will appreciate maybe going to see live music more and the fact that we can do that. And it'll be a, you'll you'll have a couple records in the can and it'll be like full speed ahead, I hope, you know. I hope so, too. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking yeah. forward to it for everybody. We can not have this fear over our heads. And, and yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much to, to you, man. I can't uh, thank you enough for spending this time with me and answering all my absolutely. questions. So yeah, gracious. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, thanks again to the nice folks from Orange, Alex. Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. appreciate it.